Hello, I'm Bruce Garner, and you are tuned in to the Unity Project. This session, we're going to focus on the first bit of Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, in that part, uh, in chapter 1, Paul opens with an incredible list of the standing that faithful believers have in Christ and follows with an equally incredible prayer that we've already looked at. Chapter 1 concludes this way, And he put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. One writer made this comment about that passage. Yes, Christ is over all, and that is grand enough. But this is done for the sake of the church. The church is the authoritative extension of Christ with full power to act on his behalf in this age. The rule of Christ, guaranteed by the work of the Father, extends to the church. The church is the place where Christ moves freely without any opposition, if that was always true. The demonic powers resist and seek to deceive believers, but Christ's reign is extended through the believing community. Only our revelation of Jesus today, outside of what is disclosed in his word, is through his church in which he is fully invested. Wow. Now that's where we left off last time. Chapter 2 opens with a look back to the condition the believers had before they turned to Christ. And it's not, it's not a pretty picture. They're dead to God, uh, unwitting followers of the devil, living in captivity to the passions of body and mind, and facing final judgment of God's wrath. Here's how it reads. This is chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. It'll be on your screen. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you previously walked according to the ways of the world, according to the ruler who exercised authority over the lower heavens, the spirit now working in the disobedient. We too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thought, and we were by nature children under wrath as others were also. That's the Holman version. Oh my, that's the way it was. Hopeless, ignorant, living like captive animals, uh, captive by our own sin, thinking we were free, but living in ever greater bondage. Were you like that? I know I was. Then Paul brings the hammer, but God. That changes things. When you invite God into the situation, things change. Let's look at verses 4 through 10. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no man may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, with God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Paul answers four questions in this passage. What did God do? How did he do the things he did? Why did he do these things? And what's the big picture? Well, what's the first question? What did God do? Well, first of all, he made us alive together with Christ. He raised us up with Jesus and seated us with Christ in the heavenlies. Well, that's about it. He made us alive. We were dead in sin. We were cut off from God. And by the Holy Spirit, as we gave ourselves to trust in him and gave our lives to him, his spirit came in and enlivened our spirit. So now we're awakened to God. We're now aware of who God is, what he's done, and how that affects the rest of our life. And we've been raised up with Jesus. What does that mean? Jesus now is at the seat of all authority. And we're there with him. He has invested his authority in and through us. He works through us by the power of the Holy Spirit. We're raised up with Jesus. And it says we're seated with him in the heavenlies. Well, where is that? Is that in heaven? Five times Paul uses this heavenlies phrase. It, in your Bibles, it probably says heavenly places, but it's really an adjective used as a verb, the heavenlies. And where is it? Is it somewhere in the by and by? It really can't be because it says that we're seated with him in the heavenlies. And we do warfare in the heavenlies. There's five different times, uh, twice in chapter 1, verses 3 and verse 20, 2, 6, what we're looking at now, 3, 10, 6, 12, tells us that we do warfare in the heavenlies. Well, where are we doing that? Right here. You see, God has invested his spirit and his life in us, and we are his representatives here. And so the heavenlies is that place where heaven and earth come together. That's been God's plan all along. 
He, he, in the Garden of Eden, there he was with them. In the tabernacle, God came to dwell with people. In the temple, there was God. And now where's God? He is in us. We are seated with him and we're his representatives, his partners with us in ministry right here and now. God wants to use us in that way. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. We live in both dimensions at the same time with one eye on heaven, the other one on earth, one ear open to God, the other one hearing what's going on around us. Well, why did he do these things that he did? It says by grace, or how did he do these things? By grace, through faith. These words are basically a shorthand way of describing the relational dynamic that we have with God. What is grace? We hear that it's unmerited favor, but that doesn't really tell us very much, does it? Grace is God himself by the Spirit working on our behalf. I like what Philippians 2.13 says, it is God who works within us both to do and to will his good pleasure. That is, he gives us the desire and the ability to do his will. Grace is God at work in and through us. What's faith? We often say belief, but that can be just a mental thing. But faith is really trusting what God has said and what he's doing. When we put our life totally in God's hands, we are trusting him with our lives. That's, that's faith. How did God do these things? By grace, by his work, through faith, by our trusting him. And why did he do these things? It says because of his love. The very stuff, the whole being that God is, is love. He is totally committed to our well-being and the well-being of everyone on the planet. And because he's rich in mercy. Mercy comes from his love. Because he loves us, he shows mercy. Mercy is always a free gift. It's not getting what you do deserve. If there wasn't for mercy, there'd just be little piles of ash where God had to bring judgment to us. But instead, because of his love, he shows mercy so that we can continue to give us the desire and ability to do his will. So what's the big picture here? It's in that last couple of sentences or that last couple of verses. Let me, let's read it together in the New Living Translation. God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It's the gift of God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we've done, so none can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he has planned for us long ago. We're his representatives here in the planet. God had a plan from long ago, conceived out of his love for us, his unshakable commitment to our good. His love birthed mercy toward us so that he lived the life we were meant and created to live and then gave up his own life as our representative on a cross of execution to take away sin once and for all and for all time. Now when we trust what he's done and put our lives into his hands, he forgives us, restores us to sharing life with him and with each other by coming to live in us and through us by the Holy Spirit. Once we were marred by sin, cut off from the source of life, disfigured and broken. But God takes the broken pieces of our lives and puts us together more useful and beautiful than before. Kintsugi is a Japanese art form that takes broken pottery and uses gold to repair and put back the, the, the broken pieces, making it whole again and more beautiful than it was before it was broken. And just like Kintsugi, those places where we were broken by sin often become the areas where we're strongest and where the, the beauty of God's salvation and our humanness can be seen the most. Have you had a but God moment in your life? that turned a broken part of your history into example of his mercy and his great love, not getting the consequence you really deserved. An example of God working in you to give you the desire and the ability to do his will. Ezekiel 37 tells of a time when the prophet saw a valley of dry bones and the spirit told him, can these bones live? Asked him that question. He said, you know, Lord. And so he commanded the, the bones to live and they were all put together, but they weren't alive. And he said, can these bones live? He said, you know. And so he asked the, the prophet to ask him to, to breathe in them. And, and he breathed in them the breath of life and they came alive. That's a picture of what happened to us. We were dead in sin and trespass, but now we're alive in Christ. That image foretold the coming from death to life by Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit. In your discussion time, Take some time with your group and share your story of coming alive in Christ. And 
perhaps about areas of your brokenness that God has made into examples of his mercy and grace.